Hello, welcome back to Beginning Engineers. Today I'm going to be talking about metrology. Measuring to know things. I find metrology super fascinating, um, so hopefully some of my interest in it can rub off on you a little bit. So, what is metrology? Well, metrology is the science of measurement. It's all about how we measure things. And in order to know the world around us, you have to measure it. You have to make observations and measurements. Internationally, it is governed by the International Bureau of Weights and Measures. The acronym for them is BIPM, which is weird because looking at the name, you would think it'd be IBWM, but it's because it's a different language. So the acronym translates over a little bit differently. Metrology is divided into three main categories, three main functions. Defining internationally accepted units of measurement, realizing these units of measurement in practice, and applying chains of traceability, linking measurements made in practice to reference standards. And you're going to hear traceability a few times in this video. That is huge when it comes to metrology, because when it comes to measuring things, how can you really trust the measurement you're receiving or the person that is telling you the measurement of something? It all ties back to traceability, which all ties back to a single standard. So metrology itself has three basic subfields. So there's kind of three divisions of metrology. First, you have scientific fundamental metrology. This is focused on the development of new measurement methods, the realization of measurement standards and traceability. So people involved in these fields have the most accurate measures on the planet. We're talking insane technologies to create these standards and keep them safe. So the International Bureau of Weights and Measures has identified nine metrology areas. Kind of stemming from that, the seven base SI units are as follows. For distance, the meter is standard. For mass, it's the kilogram. For time, it's the second. For current, it's the amp. For temperature, it's Kelvin. For amount of a substance, you're talking about moles. And for intensity of light, you're talking about, I believe, candela is how it's pronounced, candela. If you're American, you might notice that a lot of these standard measures are part of the metric system. I'm a big proponent of the metric system, and this is just another reason why. An example of why traceability and standard units are so important, and a standard at the very top, think about an industry. If two different people are trading parts or a buyer is buying parts from a seller, but they have a different definition of a kilogram, imagine all the confusion that would cause. And you might be thinking, well, I mean, come on, you can go to the store and buy a standard kilogram. Yes, that's true. And for most applications and in most industries, it's not a big deal. But as you get more and more fine in your measurements, you will find that maybe your kilogram is different from their kilogram. So arguments begin to arise. And as technology advances, we have gotten more and more accurate building these standards. The picture of that gentleman holding a sphere of silicon is part of the Avogadro project, a recent attempt to define a kilogram in a new way. So that sphere is pure silicon, a crystal form of silicon. The reason they chose that material is because the electronics industry that makes computer chips has a very, very efficient way to make pure silicon. So there's not a lot of defects. So that sphere is exactly 93.6 millimeters. But everything has a tolerance, right? Well, for that sphere, it's 0.3 nanometers. You're talking single layers of atoms. That's how precise that sphere is. And that could become the new standard for the kilogram. So few industries are gonna argue to a point where that sphere is not good enough for the argument. If this whole traceability thing seems kind of confusing and you don't understand why so much effort would be put into making a very advanced, specific standard, imagine a more simple example. You and a friend, you're both children, let's say, agree to trade a certain amount of material to one another. And you say, I'll give you 12 inches of this Play-Doh or clay. You give me 12 inches of your clay, you know, a different color. And the only thing you each have to measure your own material, your own toys, separately is a really cheap ruler. And you each have a really cheap one. Is it possible to think you might be slightly off in your measurement compared to your friend, that your rulers, if put right next to each other, 
might look slightly different in size. Now for kids, that's not a big deal, but this issue carries over into industry. Now sure, it's not something you can see with the eye in a lot of industry settings, but these issues matter, especially with very precise, expensive technologies. Looking at the other two subfields of metrology, there is applied, technical, or industrial metrology. This is the application of measuring systems in industry. So I was in manufacturing for two years, so I worked with people involved with this kind of metrology. So in industry, you're very concerned with calibration, so making sure that your measuring equipment is working and can be traced back to the highest standards. In the United States, that's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So they have really good standards at their locations. Then the final area of metrology is legal metrology. Metrology that arises from a legal standpoint to protect human health, public safety, the environment. It enables fair taxation, protection of consumers, and fair trade. Here's a fun fact. Nine out of ten people in metrology work in commercial metrology. And that makes sense, too. I mean, think about if you're at the store and you buy a box of pasta and it says 500 grams. You don't want them to only sell you 450 grams. And companies could get away with this, too. You know, it's not like a crime someone commits where someone's murdered or hit with a car. Very obvious. Crimes in metrology, not a lot of people can discover. You're not going to go home and measure things all the time. You know, and if you do, you don't really maybe understand what an acceptable tolerance is. That's why commercial metrology, which is part of legal metrology, is so huge. And you interact with this a lot in your daily life. Think about when you go to the gas station. Have you ever seen that sticker that says, certified by, you know, your local district of weights and measures? It's certified for a year. That's the same concept for gas. You want to make sure that when you're pumping two or three gallons into your car, you're getting your two or three gallons worth, especially when gas gets expensive. Here are some definitions that you might come across when talking about metrology or measuring. There is accuracy, which is the degree of exactness to which the final product corresponds to the measurement standard. There is precision, which refers to the ability of a measurement to be consistently reproduced. So precision is not accuracy. It's just can you be in the same area of measurement again and again and again? And people mix up precision and accuracy quite a bit in the real world. You have reliability, which refers to the consistency of accurate results over consecutive measurements over time. So you can measure something accurately now, but what about in a week? If you can't measure it accurately again in a week, your tool is not reliable. Then there's traceability, which we have talked about a decent amount in this video. Traceability refers to the ongoing validation that the measurement of the final product conforms to the original standard of measurement. It all goes back to that single great standard that we can all agree on. And I'll end this video with some examples going back to applied technical or industrial metrology. So here are some measurement tools you might see in industry. First, there's the optical comparator. It's the image in the top right. An optical comparator projects the shadow of an image onto a screen to be measured more accurately. So for example, you could walk up to that machine, put like a quarter onto it, and then on the screen it would project the shadow of that quarter as large as a big dinner plate. And of course you can imagine why that would be useful. It blows up an image for you. And even more useful than that is over the screen where you're looking at the shadow, you can place uh, see-through laminates that have measurement systems on them or shapes of what the image should look like. So sometimes it allows for a very fast way to measure an object. Then you have calipers, which are very common in industry. Calipers are devices used to measure the distance between two points, a linear distance. You have micrometers, which are generally a subset of the caliper family. They too measure a linear, linear distance, but usually a bit more accurately than calipers. So they get down to a more narrow dimension. And also, micrometers usually can only measure things between 1 and 2 inches or 2 and 3 inches. They don't have as large a range as calipers. Calipers are usually between like 1 and 9 inches. Then you have a whole family of tools known as CMMs. CMMs are coordinate measuring machines. Uh, they can be a variety of machine types. What's cool about CMMs is they're usually hooked to a computer. You know, they're digital. 
Uh, they measure a series of points to obtain numerous dimensions. So with the CMM, you could just take two points and measure a line. You could take 100 points in five seconds and measure a surface. You can do angles and arcs. CMMs can be pretty comical in industry, actually. Uh, if you happen to be doing work near one and someone has it on a continuous measurement mode, it might make tons of beeping noises if they have the sound on. So it kind of almost sounds like a ringing. It, it can be pretty funny at first. But that is what's nice about CMMs. They create a digital object from the measurements. So you can set it to continuous mode and say, I'm going to take 10,000 points. And you can do it in a relatively short amount of time. One type of CMM that is really popular is the portable CMM. Uh, they usually look like arms. Uh, they're very expensive, but they're portable. They're easy to handle. Uh, they're more manual, actually. They require a lot less programming. So if you don't want to train your operators as well or your quality people, it can be an easier thing for them to learn. But then again, non-portable CMMs, once someone creates the program, all you really have to do is set the object in place and run the program. Anyway, when it comes to portable CMMs, there's really two brand names I hear all the time. You either hear Faro Arm or Romer Arm. Those brands are so popular, they become synonymous with portable CMM. Much in the same way that if you tell someone to get you an adhesive bandage, you usually say, hey, can you grab me a band-aid? Thank you so much for watching this video about metrology. I hope I've sparked your interest in the subject, or at least have taught you a decent amount so that you now understand what metrology is, why it's useful, and why traceability matters. If you like this video, please subscribe. Thanks for watching.